Hi, my name is Ananias. I am not really a big deal in the Bible, but if you can read about my little story in chapter 9. And I'm the Ananias that's associated with Saul, not the Ananias with that Sapphira, just in case you're thinking I'm that guy. Um, but the reason I want to tell my story is because I think some things from my story may be really, really helpful for what you guys are going through right now. So I'm from Damascus, which is like 136 miles from Jerusalem. And we had gone down there for the Passover because Jewish people go back to Jerusalem for the Passover. And it was an incredible week. I mean, we heard about this prophet named Jesus that he was supposedly doing miracles and we had heard about him moving over in Damascus. And we got there and we were hearing all this buzz about maybe he was the Messiah. And then when the Passover came, we heard he was crucified. And just like such a dark moment and the, in fact, the city got dark. And then three days later, there was this wild rumor that he was really was the Messiah and that he was raised from the dead. And, and I wish I could tell you how incredibly euphoric those next few days were, where the, the news of, of his resurrection just went like wildfire. And then, and then a short time later, we were at the next feast of Pentecost and the Spirit of God came and, and all of a sudden people started becoming followers of Jesus because he'd been in that region for three years. And, and we were in a church, like a mega church. It was like 3,000 people got saved in one day. And so we were probably like 5,000 in number. And we met every day in the temple where our, our people have seen as a worship center for God for hundreds of years. And the apostles, I mean, how, how would you like to be talking with the 11 apostles and telling stories about Jesus and, and all of this incredible sense that this is an invincible movement. And, and my envisionment was that Jesus told us to go into all the world, and that meant these mega churches were just gonna like hopscotch all over the globe. And it was so incredibly encouraging and exciting until they started killing us. I remember that day, it was one of our brothers named Stephen, and he had been a powerful speaker for Jesus. And they rounded him up, and they were trying to make him deny Jesus. And man, he gave like a killer message, just standing up and saying who Jesus was, and and what we were doing as followers of Jesus or followers of the way. And they got so angry. It was like it just fueled that hatred from the, the Jewish leaders who had been against Jesus and that's why they crucified him. And now, and now they were against the church. And so they took him outside of town and they started picking up huge rocks and flow through the air and they're just crunching into his bones and killing him. And in, that middle, in the middle of that, he looked up and he said, I see the heavens opened and I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Oh, that just made him matter. They just killed him right there. And then it's like, you'd think that that would make things calm down a bit, but it was like lighting a fuse. In fact, there was a young firebrand there named Saul, and he was a scholar and a firebrand, and he didn't throw any rocks that day, but man, instead of feeling remorse or, or maybe shame, he, he just it like felt fueled. And so he began to haul people off to prison and try to kill people, and did kill some. And, and man, we just fled. We ran back to our own towns and, and I went back to Damascus. And let me tell you, it was a huge sense of loss. I mean, we had been in the temple. We had been listening to the apostles, not just on Sabbath, but on every day of the week. And now we were in Damascus and there was just a few of us. And we were fearful and, and we didn't know what was gonna happen next. And all of those things that we thought had been part of what God was gonna do, that did not happen. Um, apparently God's plan to spread the church over the whole world was different than ours. He used persecution and difficulty and hardship and, and in spite of that, God was at work and the Holy Spirit was living inside of us and, and we began to tell people about Jesus and this hope that we have and, and, and they began to come and be followers of the way and it, and it was growing and that's when Saul heard about it and, and we heard through our underground that he had gotten papers from Jerusalem to come and to throw us into prison and to try to kill us. And, and it was in that scary moment, I just felt like, I wish we could go back. I wish we could go back to experience those heady days with the temple and the apostles and all those numbers of people. But we couldn't go back. We had to go ahead. And then I got this call in the middle of the night. <laughs> not, not a phone call, you understand, but a, a vision from God. I mean, he said, Ananias. Yes, sir. Yes, Lord, whatever you want. I mean, what else do you say when God calls you in the middle of the night? And then he said, I have a mission for you. I'm on it. He said, I have a guy that you need to go pray for. Great. He says, his name is Saul of Tarsus. 
No, 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 no. Don't you know why he's come here? Don't you know what he's doing? Don't you know he's that guy? You see, God was asking me to step up. And I thought, well, Jesus' mission ended in death, and Stephen's mission ended in death, and I had to ask, is this a suicide mission? And yet God had already told me that that's what he wanted me to do. And so by faith, I took off to go pray for this guy named Saul, the least likely person to ever become a follower of Jesus. And I tell you that story because I know you've gone through a lot of loss. And the church may not look like you thought it was going to look, and it may not look like it used to look. But I believe the mission of God is always going forward. And we can't go back, but we can go forward. So I hope that this is an encouragement to you. Isn't that an interesting perspective that what's going on in Douglas County right now informs us of how we look at that story of Ananias and the early church, and maybe, maybe we put more feeling and more understanding into what they went through. And, and I think it helps us then answer the question, how should we respond? That what we can learn from the early church to be that vibrant church is get, again. And I, I see a couple of people, or I see a couple of different responses from people. Some people seem to think that Christians don't cry, and they have this stiff response of cliches, God's good all the time, and and, and they kind of act like it's not supposed to bother us because we're Christians. And then there's a second group that are the opposite. They are all about my feelings and my struggle and quite often giving in to self-pity. And, and the refrain seems to be, oh, I can't wait to go back. And, and a feeling that somehow the church is being compromised or destroyed by all that's gone on. And then there's another group, which is deeply encouraging to me, that that I want us to look at, and that is people who are honestly struggling, who say, this is hard, and, and my relationship with Christ is making a difference for me. I, I'm putting on my own oxygen mask, and I hope as we walk through some scriptures last weekend, that was helpful for you to do that. But instead of saying, how can we go back? They're saying, this is an opportunity for the church. In fact, this is an opportunity maybe to clarify what the church is about and how to move forward. So the story of Ananias comes from Acts chapter 8 and 9. And I want to go back and, and just highlight some of the things from those scriptures. Hopefully we can see it with more clarity because of what's going on right now. So Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, says, And Saul approved of their killing him. We just referred to Stephen being stoned to death, and he was the first martyr of the church in Jerusalem. And it says, And on that day that Stephen was stoned, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. Remember, we said 5,000 people, basically everybody but the core group, took off and went back to their hometowns, went back to wherever they could find shelter. And it says, throughout Judea and Samaria, and godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. This was a, a huge loss. Can you imagine watching one of your own brothers or sisters in Christ be killed with stones? This was a time when people were scared. People left. Some of them left their homes in Jerusalem, and some of them went back to their homes elsewhere. And then it says, and Saul began to destroy the church. That, that was his intent, was to stomp out this movement before it ever really got started. And it says, going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And that's the ugly side of this. That's the, the dark side of it. But then there's this little glimmer of light. It says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. What was their response to the crisis? What was their take on, they're trying to kill the church? Their take was, this is not easy. This has been really painful. But the message of Jesus is more relevant than ever. And wherever they went, they began to start a spark of people who were followers of Jesus. And so when we talk about that question of how we are to respond, one of my first encouragements is for you to be honest about loss. This has been a tough year. I saw a meme that said, if 2020 were a hula hoop and it showed a, a coil of razor wire, it seems like there's been disappointment after disappointment and difficulty following difficulty. And, and the, the smoke we've been breathing has been such a reminder of that. And so it's been difficult, and some of the losses have been tangible. And, and I believe that it's important that we admit that, that we've lost, some of you have lost 
buildings and homes. Certainly we've lost normalcy as, as we knew it. Some of you have, are struggling with the loss of schools and your children are, are trying to be taught online or, or in other ways. And we're struggling with the loss of jobs sometimes and money and all kinds of tangible losses. But I think we're also struggling with less tangible losses, which are security. We don't know what's going to happen next. Um, clarity. It seems like there's so many voices saying, this is the truth and don't miss this. And we've certainly lost unity. There used to be a, a feeling that we're on the same page and now there's so much conflict. And honestly, that's been the hardest one for me is the divisions and the different people who start not just speaking a different view, but start being ugly and awful towards each other. And there's been this, this loss of so many things that we considered normal. And I think that part of responding to this in a biblical fashion is to be honest about what did I lose? Um, there's a, a book that we're going to be going through in many of the life groups this fall, and it's called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And I think when we start talking about emotional health, some people react to that like it's just psychobabble. But, but chapter 5 has got a great title. It just says, Enlarging Your Soul Through Grief and Loss. What would it look like if, if instead of thinking that this was destroying the church, if it actually began to help us really learn to grieve in a godly, in a good way? It's sad that nobody tells you that when you're a kid, but one of the skills that you need to learn is how to grieve and how to let things go. And, and in fact, I think there's a spiritual cleansing part of that. And then there's the other part of it is, whoever you're talking to, what did you lose? And maybe it's different than what I lost, and maybe your reaction is different, and I think that it's easy for us to lose compassion, especially if I've had a lot of losses. It's, it's easy to compare, to try to say, well, mine was worse than yours, or compare in some way that, that is this sort of competition. And I think one of the best things we can do right now is listen, to say, what's going on? How are you struggling? What's, what's happening in your life? And, and it may be different than your losses, and it may be more extreme or less extreme, but it's a way for us to not only grow and draw closer to Christ, but I think that this is a way to open some spiritual conversations. What is the thing that you are struggling with? What's the difficulty that you're going through? And in the middle of that which is shaken, I think it's really important for us to say, let's go back to what's unshakable. Let's go back to the basics. And I honestly feel like God does this regularly in our lives that he will shake things in our lives that we are leaning on too heavily. You see, the things that we begin to trust instead of God can become what the Bible calls an idol. That this is actually what God is shaking because it's revealing things that shouldn't be so important to us. And certainly, it's easy for us to make money an idol and it's easy for us to make the things that are temporary possessions. We, we kind of get that. But I think one of the things that's been illustrated in this whole process is we thought that church was a wonderful, beautiful auditorium with air conditioning where we could sit in comfort and we could listen to beautiful worship music and then we could have a well-presented message and we could go out feeling good and, and we equated that way too much with being followers of Jesus. And I even thought, what if in all these fires, what if our church building had burned down? What would the church be then? Would we still be the church? Because I know we say that the church isn't the building, but we often act like the church is about the weekend service. And that is only a small part of what the church meeting is. And so I, I think it's important for us to go back and to say, what is it that God is calling us to see differently because of these crises? And to go back to the things that are important. What, what, what was the early church a part of, whether they were in the big group in Jerusalem or in the little group in Damascus. And they were all about the scriptures, the apostles' teaching, which we now have that's embodied in the, in the New Testament. They, they were all about prayer. And you say, I can't do anything but pray, but that's what we need to do. They were about being in community. The, the New Testament never talks about a solo Christian. It's always in a connection of relationships and in caring for each other and in speaking truth to each other and challenging each other. And they were all about serving, pouring out their lives for the king. Those things are non-negotiable. The church, no matter where we are in the world, those are the basics that we've got to get back to. 
You know, I, I feel like the fra- refrain is often, oh, I can't wait to go back. And I, and I don't think we can go back. In fact, let me say it stronger. I don't think we should go back. I think that we have to go forward. And one of the things we'd like to do is to invite you, if you're not already meeting together with other believers, to do that. And you know, you say, well, I, I can't stand a mask. And let me just ask you a challenging question. Is, is this what it takes to stop you serving Jesus? Because I think the question we see from the early church is, will I serve him anyway? When they were scattered from Jerusalem to Damascus, did they serve Jesus anyway? When Ananias gets called to go and serve God, does he go anyway? And you say, well, I can watch it in my jammies at home with, with my cup of coffee. And you know, I think one of the things that God is wanting to shake in us is that we have way too much love of comfort. We really like it when everything's about me. And what does it mean when serving God means it's less about me? In fact, it's some sacrifice involved. And you say, well, why do I need to go to a church building? Or why do I need to go to a fellowship group? Or why do I need to go to a life group? Or why do I need those? I don't need that for me. You know, it's interesting. If you're at the Sutherland campus, we've been having 90 to 100 people come and And what's interesting is there's been about four or five brand new families that have never been to our church before. Why why do you need to come? Partly because you need to meet them. You need to encourage them. You need to draw them in. You see, it's not all about me. It's about us. And there's a, a work that God is doing in the middle of difficulty. And the question is, is do I want to serve God anyway? No matter what. I guess we've asked that question before. What does it take to cause you to stop? And I want to look at the story a little more in detail of Ananias. And in Damascus, it says there was a disciple named Ananias, and that's who we featured in that first opening clip. And the Lord called him in, in a vision and said, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. What else do you say? And it says, goes on and it says, I want you to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying And I think there's this funny disconnect there in Ananias' response because he starts talking to God and God says to him, in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias. (laughs) God has already told Saul that Ananias is coming before he tells Ananias he's coming. Now, he gets voluntold. And and I'm thinking, if I was him, I'd think, is there anybody in our fellowship named Ananias? Can Can I make this about somebody else? He says, I want you to place his hands on him to restore his sight. (laughs) <laughs> he's supposed to go and meet this killer of Christians and pray for him. And what's his response? He says, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. <laughs> Do you ever catch yourself praying like God's really not up to speed? Like he doesn't know what's going on or maybe he doesn't know how it feels down here. And Ananias says to him, God, do you know who this is that you're talking about? Are you in touch with reality? You know what God would say? Oh, I'm in touch with reality, but it's a lot bigger than your reality. You see, you think this is about you facing into a hard conversation, a hard prayer time. But this Saul, this guy who's least likely to become a follower of Jesus, is going to become one of the most important players in how my Good news about Jesus goes out to the world. And Ananias had this critically important, small, difficult task that he thought God didn't understand. What if that's you? What if God's calling you to some small, simple obediences that may be scary to you? And yet those are such a small piece of a much bigger reality of what God's trying to do. You see, I think we often try to shrink God down to our feelings instead of know that he feels our feelings but he's got a much bigger plan, a much bigger reality. And part of that, I believe, is that all of us need to move to having Jesus conversations. This is a time of great disruption, but it is a time of incredible opportunity. Just like your life has been shaken, so has everybody else's life been shaken. And the gospel generally moves forward better when people need good news. And you need to know how to share the good news. You need to know how to make this about Jesus. And I think it's important to say helping is great. Love means doing. 
It doesn't mean sitting back and just saying, I, I hope you do better. And it's been cool to see so many people open up and start helping. One of the cool pictures I got to see about how the body of Christ is connected is a family that lives way out at the end of Nonpareil Road, and they're fairly new, and they're from California. So they didn't have any local connections. They didn't have any family here. And you know, when they got a, a notice that they had to evacuate, you know who they reached out to? They reached out to another family that had been part of their life group, that had gotten to know each other closely. And they called them and they said, is there any chance we can come to your house? And they have a house that was within a safe zone, and, but they weren't there. <laughs> they were on a trip down in Arizona. And so the family of God became literal family. And they, they said, you can take over our house. Here's how to get in, whatever you need. And, and the family that lived down non Perel, they said, we have some neighbors that need some help too. Can we bring them also? And they came and they brought them to stay in their house. Why? Because loving Jesus and loving his people and loving people who need Jesus is part of what we're called to do. But doing is not enough. Some people say, well, I'll just, just obey the Lord and help people and I don't need to say anything. But you know what? If you do good things and you never tell them it's from Jesus, then you get all the credit. And it's great that you help people and that's a wonderful testament, but it's not the same as telling them. So I think there's helping and then talking. We need to move on to Jesus' conversations. And, and I think it starts with being vulnerable to say, yeah, this has been really tough. I think we need to be open about our own struggles. This has been a tough season. And <laughs> a friend of mine said, if you're not struggling, you're not paying attention. You're not being honest because there are lots of losses and there's grief and you know, so many normal hard things are still going on in the middle of all these other hard things. And it's actually exacerbating some of them so we need to be vulnerable. We need to say, this is tough. In fact, not a fake smile or putting a, a little sticker on it, but saying, this is a hard year. And I think you'll find, and there's a technique I want you to practice. I think you'll find that that helps you then have an opening to talk about things. Because you can say, here's how I'm struggling. You can also ask them, how are you struggling? How has this been tough for you? What is, how has this impacted you? Beyond just, yeah, I hate the smoke and I hate the masks and whatever surface conversations there might be. And, and let me encourage you to have compassion. And don't just give them a cliche. There's a reason for everything. God is good all the time. There's, those are true, but they're not very helpful at those points. But I think if you say to them, how are you struggling? And then ask that next question. What's helped you? And maybe they give you some shallow answer. Maybe they say nothing helps. It also gives you an opportunity to say, Let's, this is what helps me. Man, my relationship with Jesus, the fact that I got a close fellowship of people that love Jesus, that we're connected to each other, man, that has made this intolerable situation something that I can get through. And so if we can move past the crisis, past the I wish we could get back to, to say, God, what are you leading for, uh, forward to? And then be involved in compassionate caring for people, but also to bring up those Jesus conversations because people are looking for answers. And you know what? We're not any better than anybody else, but we have been privileged to have the good news about Jesus. And so I hope that we can take those steps and begin to move to being more active in saying what the good news about Jesus is, can impact in our time. In fact, I'm going to ask Pastor Ed to come up, and we're going to talk about what does this mean for what is the, really the church to be? What is the church about, and what does the current conversation need to be that's reflecting what the biblical foundation is? What do you think, Pastor Ed? Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate the comments that you've made in the message. And uh, when I think of the church, I think of Jesus standing with his disciples, and he's, he's telling them, he says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not stand against it. This is going to be an unstoppable movement of God. And I think sometimes when we think of the church, we're just thinking of buildings and locations, and, uh, and often we say, hey, we're going to go to church. But Jesus was thinking not of a building and not of just one location. He was thinking of a movement of people, a congregation of people, a gathering of people on mission that were sharing the gospel and making impact throughout the world. Yeah, I think we use this terminology. Instead of going to church, we need to be the church. And that's not just a slogan. That's not just a cliche. That's a real paradigm shift about what does it mean? In fact, the old go to church was a built on an addition idea. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think we could see how that even in the early church, they, they had the addition, you know, when, when, uh, uh, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he, uh, there was a group of people that were praying together, and for, for days they were praying, as a, and there was 120 of them. And then the, the, in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came, and that was the beginning of this church. Peter gets up and speaks. 3,000 people were added to their number, and then they start meeting in the temple, and, uh, and, and house to house, and daily people were added to their number. And so this large group, as you were sharing in your message, how that they were coming together and they were growing, they were experiencing this euphoric uh, work of God that was amazing. But it was kind of addition. And, uh, and it's interesting because God's done that at Family Church. And we've been here many years. I've been here 34 years. You've been here a lot of years. And, 18, yeah. and, uh, and he's added to people coming to our campuses. He's added campuses. He's added, there's been a lot of good things and a lot of baptisms and people coming to Christ. But, but there's been this idea that addition means inviting people to church, they hear the gospel, and then the church disciples them. And what, what's the switch when we talk about multiplication? What's the change in our thinking? So multiplication is, is really a change in, in the format from rather than just inviting people to church as that is our mode of evangelism, but having spiritual conversations. You were talking about that a moment ago. Spiritual conversations with people and praying for people, building relationships. It seems like the, the, the addition model has has brought us to uh, come from the world, get in the church, build all of our friendships among the people of our, and, and we have a hard time sometimes after a year or two, we have no friends that are lost people. Yeah, I just watched an interesting message and it was convicting because he said, how many significant relationships do you have with people that are not believers? How many influential relationships? And, and as I mentioned before, we want you to come to our meetings with a mission. There are people there that are coming that are needing Jesus and needing disciples. We also want you to go outside the walls on mission because those significant relationships where they can see Jesus in you in a common workaday world and, and honestly, helping people in these crises has been a great way for people to mix together, people who are believers and non-believers. Yeah, so, it's, so that whole uh, multiplication idea is that you are building relationships with people, praying with them, inviting them, and seeing them come to faith, people helping people find and follow Jesus. It's a, mis it's a missional, but it's also a multiplication model. Um, multiplication is when you bring somebody to faith, they become a follower of Jesus, and they bring somebody to faith, and they become a f follower of Jesus. You become a parent that becomes a grandparent that begins to see the movement of God, not just the collection of people on a weekend. And I don't want to go back to a thousand plus people meeting on the weekend and 50 baptisms, although it's great to see 50 baptisms, but I don't think that's what Jesus died for the church and what he envisioned when he said the church will be unstoppable. And I think the simple mindset goes from the church will lead people to Jesus, the church will disciple, to I'm a disciple and I'm a disciple maker. And that's a huge shift and we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. It's easy to go back and forth. And so the question is, how do we go forward? What's happening at Family Church? How do we move forward with this new paradigm? Yeah, so... Um, the easy thing is just let's go back, <laughs> but with we've, as you said, we've got to go forward. And, and so going forward is, um, is we, need, we, we want to bring people back into community. Uh, we will have um, our, work, our weekend services of, at 9 o'clock and 11, both at Sutherland and in Green. And at our South Umpqua campus, we have fellowship groups. These are meeting in homes, and God is doing some incredible things. About 50-so people are meeting in, in two fellowship groups. If you want to connect in those. The best way to do that is to contact Pastor Jason, uh, and, uh, and he will help you get connected in, in one of those fellowship groups. But if you are not yet coming back to, the, fellow, uh, to, the, to the, the weekend service, that is your first step. We now have uh, kids ministry that is starting next week at Sutherland, already started in, at, at Green. So I know that's been a barrier for people, but uh, the first thing is, you know, look at how you can come back. And if you can't come back, then... Um, Invite some people to join you with you online. And uh, our whole light online ministry has been a multiplication idea because we, as a church, completely shut down for a period. There was many people that were watching all over the world, and we're, we're making impact in places we, we never thought we would before. Yeah, and it's been an exciting way to see that as we can't move ahead in some directions, God has moved us far ahead in other directions. 
So the second thing is, uh, after, you know, we're gathering again in the auditoriums, and that, and and really the the what's what we look at in the future is the is the gathering on the weekend is the church of community groups, the, the, those life groups all coming together uh, to join in, in together. But the next thing is to get involved in a life group. Many of you have um, have been connected all summer. Some people were took a hiatus, took a, a, a time away for your life group. This weekend, we're saying it's time to get back in. Our life groups are starting up really quickly. And so if you've been in a life group uh, and it's been on hiatus, it's time to get back. If you've not been in a life group, if you need a life group, uh, there are spots available for you. So uh, whether it be a, a in-person or we were looking at maybe you can only do it through Zoom, but we want to we want everybody to find a community where they are are together, and that's our first step of being uh, moving from just multi, uh, addition to multiplication. The first step is let's let's come back together uh, and and uh, and see God do some amazing things as we do. And there's all kinds of ways to serve as well. We need people that'll open up their homes and host a life group. Um, we need people that will help lead life groups. So there's great needs all around. And maybe you're asking, what can I do? And uh, there's all kinds of ways for people to meet together in threes and fours and eights and tens and Zoom meetings and etc. And so as we move forward, we're challenging you to say, what does it mean for me to be on mission in this time for God's purposes for Douglas County for right now? We hope this has been an encouragement to you. We want to give you a discussion question to finalize it. And that's just simply saying, where are you going to connect in community? And we want you both to connect with believers. We also want you to ask that second question is, how do I connect with unbelievers so that I am taking Jesus into whatever scenario he's placed me in? And so we want you to wrestle with both those questions. And so discuss that uh, in, your, in your campuses. Your, your uh, leader will they'll kind of direct you. If you're watching in the fellowship group, if you're watching online, just take a few moments and let the Spirit of God kind of percolate that question in your heart.